Hello, everyone, and um, good morning. Uh, I would like to wish you a big, warm, big warm welcome uh, to the Rewilding Principles in Practice webinar uh, organized by Rewilding Europe. It is really fantastic to see uh, so many of you uh, present today, and um, thank you so much for your interest and uh, for uh, joining this celebration and the launch of the UN Decade. Um, I'm sure that uh, many of you are already familiar with uh, Rewilding Europe and, um, and our work. Um, however, do allow me to say a few words to introduce uh, our organization. Um, Rewilding Europe is an independent uh, non-profit um, based in the Netherlands. Um, uh, it is operating as a pioneer and a front runner of uh, European rewilding. Uh, for already a decade, our teams um, are working to create rewilded landscapes uh, all over Europe. Um, at the moment, uh, we are working in eight pilot areas. And we have uh, 70 rewilding initiatives on board the European Rewilding Network, or ERN. Um, so ERN is basically a community created to exchange best practices, uh, know-how, and uh, to boost rewilding. So uh, th through our work, what we're trying uh, to show and what we're showing is um, how nature recovery, uh, based on rewilding principles, uh, is um, one of the most effective, uh, immediate, and also economically viable ways of addressing uh, both climate change and um, biodiversity decline. Um, I'm really confident uh, to say that the uh, rewilding process in Europe uh, has achieved significant uh, momentum. And uh, this shows a united front of uh, various initiatives um, working to together and uh, driving the rewilding movement forward. Um, as an official supporting partner uh, of the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration and also a founding member of the Global Rewilding Alliance, uh, our teams are dedicated to continue strengthening uh, this movement and also promoting rewilding as a mainstream, mainstream approach to landscape scale uh, ecosystem restoration. So uh, this is a little bit about rewilding Europe and, uh, and what we do. Uh, now allow me to introduce uh, our speakers. I'm trying to change the slide, but it's not working. Ah, here. Um, uh, let me introduce my, uh, our speakers. Uh, they are both uh, my valued colleagues. Um, uh, we have two prominent biologists uh, with us uh, today. Uh, Delisa Saavedra from uh, Catalonia, who is the head of landscapes uh, through Walden Europe, and Mikhailo Nesterenko from Ukraine, who is the team. May, can I shortly Europe. interrupt? I think there are some participants who may not get any audio. I want to check shortly with our audience if there are more people experiencing this problem before we continue. Uh, Thanks so for the check. Back to the introduction. So uh, Deli and uh, Misha, thank you for being here with us and, uh, and welcome. And um, to introduce myself, my name is May. I'm tuning in from uh, sunny Zagreb, Croatia. I am the coordinator of the European Rewilding Network, which I mentioned, and uh, today I'm going to be in the role of your uh, host. Uh, let's take a quick look uh, at the agenda before we start. Um, so we're going to open the webinar uh, with the premiere video of uh, Rewilding principle, Principles that my colleague Nelika uh, prepared for us. Uh, then we're going to have uh, an interview, a coffee chat with uh, my colleague Deli Saavedra. Um, then I will take you on a virtual visit to Danube Delta so you can see the area and uh, understand better uh, what uh, Mikhailo Nesterenko is going to talk about when he's going to be presenting the rewilding principles in practice case study uh, taking place in the, in the Danube Delta. At the end, we're going to leave uh, around 10 minutes uh, for the, for the Q&A session. Uh, please feel free to post questions in the Q&A box like you are doing now during the webinar. And um, once we get to the Q&A session, we are going to try to answer as many questions as possible. Uh, now, let me play the, the video of Rewilding Principles.
hope that uh, that you liked uh, the 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 video about revolving principles. And um, now, Delhi, let's have a let's have a short chat. So, um, uh, can, can you start by telling us um, a bit um, about yourself and um, how you came to work for uh, for Revolving Europe? Well, first of all, thank you very much to join us, and I hope that you will like this webinar. Uh, well, I'm a biologist. I have been working on natural conservation and species reintroductions all my career. And then in 2012, in 2012, a Dutch friend sent me the advertise of a job opportunity called rewilding officer. And he said, uh, this is a job made for you. And then I applied and I was lucky enough to get the job. Together with a communications officer and an enterprise officer, we were the three first staff members of rewilding Europe. Oh wow, that's uh, that's that's a long time ago. I yeah. have been colleagues for uh, for a quite long time, but I have never asked you this question. Matt. Do you remember the first um, time that you heard the term rewilding? Well, the first time I heard the term rewilding was uh, when rewilding Europe was uh, mm -hmm. launched itself. So in 2011. Before I have never heard about it. And um, what it meant for you then? Um, it surprised me and, and, and pleased me at the same time, because I, I thought that finally someone was linking wildlife combat with ecological functions and giving less importance to genetics, subspecies. We were making the combat of wildlife in, in great numbers, very complicated with this approach of uh, separate uh, subspecies, separate silos. Mm -hmm. I see. Yes, um, you, you are a biologist uh, holding a PhD. You are an author of several books, and uh, I know that uh, throughout your life, um, as an uh, throughout your uh, South America, mm, my question is: What has changed in your personal perception in terms of uh, past and present environmental narratives? Well, I started my career introducing a lost species in my region, in Catalonia, that was the otter. At that time, in the 90s, that was in the 90s, uh, we called uh, the otter already flagship and also keystone species. And I remember that we were already explaining the ecological importance of the otter in the rivers. But, but I think we were missing the big picture, the, the, the holistic approach that rewilding introduces. And then, of course, in the 90s, the climate change, for example, was something seen as far away. Mm -hmm. It was not connected with the loss of biodiversity. And it was considered less important that uh, habitat destruction or invasive species. So you're saying that many puzzles actually came together. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so, uh, um... You were one of the, the, the thought leaders who gathered in the Spanish city of Suenca. Am I pronouncing it well, Suenca? In, yes, Suenca, yes. Uh, and the uh, end of 2019. And you actually wrote the set of principles. So what I'm wondering is, can you tell us a little bit about um, the vision and the, the idea behind the process and the, the creation of the Rewilding Principles? Yeah. Well, rewilding is getting traction worldwide. We know that. And, and at the same time, uh, many rewilding initiatives arise. Uh, rewilding can also become everything. That's a bit the threat. Where we were saying uh, auto reintroduction, now we can call it auto rewilding just because it gets more attention. And I believe that the rewilding principles that we produced two years ago can help focus on what is truly rewilding from a European perspective. So, for example, as you have seen in the video, pro providing hope, offering nature-based solutions, letting nature le lead, uh, building nature-based economies. The principles are, in my opinion, the DNA of how to protect and restore nature in the next decades. Yeah, this connects to my next question. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, Rewilding Europe is the founder member of the Global Rewilding uh, Alliance, which was launched uh, this March. And the Global Rewilding Alliance um, is an official restoration implementer of the of the UN decade. And uh, the, alliance, the alliance is um, uh, comprises uh, of uh, more than one hundred organizations worldwide, uh, and they are also guided by the by the set of uh, rewilding principles. Uh, so my question is: Is rewilding everywhere uh, around the world happening in the same way? And are all of these organization uh, organizations uh, actually guided by the same set of principles that we're talking about today? Um, well, first, many of the principles set up by the Global Rewilding Alliance are similar to the ones uh, we wrote in Spain two years ago. In fact, we have helped together with other organizations to develop these that we could say the world rewilding principles. 
uh, these are principles, nevertheless, uh, not prescriptive. Uh, mm -hmm. They are meant to set the direction of the rewilding efforts worldwide. And, and this is because the approach to rewilding can, can differ depending on geographies and depending on culture. So, for example, let's say wildlife compact, no? that is key for rewilding, but it's not done the same way in crowded Europe, where, for example, coexistence is key, that in South America or, for example, in Australia, where the battle against invasive species is key to allow the recovery of these endangered or, or locally extinct species. Yeah, yeah, I understand. And now a little bit more personal question. So in, uh, in, in your evolving, uh, in your everyday work, um, what is the leading principle that, uh, that governs your action, if you could choose, if you can choose one? Mm, okay, um, well, difficult to say. Um, I like to think that the main principle governing my actions is uh, providing hope and purpose that we saw also in the video. Uh, I work for a better future for nature and for people, and this is very inspiring, uh, especially in these uh, difficult times of natural destruction, climate uh, emergency, COVID, uh, doom and gloom. So I'm by default a very optimistic person. So I try to embed uh, optimism and hope in my everyday work. Yeah. Me as well. This, this, uh, I, I share this with you, Deli. Uh, the optimism. Yeah, we wish. Yeah, I know that. <laughs> so um, this week, uh, this is a this is a nice coincidence. This week uh, we are all actually here because we're celebrating the launch of the of the UN decade on ecosystem restoration. And this month, uh, Rewilding Europe, like end of June, uh, Rewilding Europe is celebrating its, uh, its 10th anniversary. So as you were one of the pioneers uh, in European rewilding, and uh, looking back to the beginning of your work and, uh, and, and your hopes then, um, how do you reflect the rewilding uh, of Europe in the decade behind us and in the decade which is, which is in front of us? Well, um, first of all, very proud to be part from the beginning of one of the first organizations in the world that uh, call itself rewilding that's fantastic um but in my opinion during the last 10 years we have been creating the basis for rewilding and at the same time thanks to our work and of course the work of other organizations scientists communicators rewilding is becoming mainstream and then sometimes as a bit of a joke I got to explain a joke. I explained that when we started, we were like the weird of the conservation, no? doing our small things in a corner. But uh, currently, when Greta Thunberg often mentions rewilding, or when Sir David Attenborough exclaims, we must rewild the world, I feel like a push right to the center, uh, under the focus, really. And this is, of course, amazing. But at the same time, is I feel a great responsibility. Yeah, we, we all remember when he said that. We were so, we were so happy. Yeah. <laughs> and um, if, like, talking hypothetically, what would be your vision of a rewilded Europe? Let's say we go 100 years up and Europe is rewilded. How would you, how do you see it? Well, yeah, my vision, and uh, this is also the slogan of rewilding Europe, uh, it would be a continent that creates much more space for nature. So you were talking about 100 years, so let's go 100 years ago. 100 years ago, the main task of Europeans were, was to produce food for a growing human population in Europe. So all lands, uh, rich and poor, were made available for, for that goal. Now the main task of the humanity, not only the Europeans, is to stabilize the climate and stop biodiversity loss. And for that, and for that we know that we need to dedicate natural areas that were used in the past for farming. Um, and this is because we start to see that our civilization is at a stake. So and I'm very confident that when we will, if we have to look in 100 years or in 50 years, we will, and I think sooner, we will uh, see a great number of uh, big rewilding natural areas in Europe, for sure. Well, for this to happen, um, we need the support of the, of the policy. And um, I'm wondering, are you confident to say that rewilding um, uh, already made its way into the, at least, EU policy? Well, little by little. I think rewilding is making its way, uh, but it's, it's a slow like anything in European Union. But now, especially with the European Green Deal, I'm more confident. There is still resistance to use the word rewilding. So the EU, the EU usually mentions restoration. It's fine. But we have uh, already, for example, targets on the kilometers of rivers that need to be restored and free uh, from dams. Uh, nevertheless, in other aspects, the European Union needs a drastic change of policy. What it has no sense is to promote restoration and at the same time subsidize forest cleaning for biomass. 
That means burning trees and send the carbon back to the atmosphere. That is completely, has completely nonsense. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. Um, when we when we look at the, the, the global level, do you think that uh, the rewilding movement globally um, can in the long term eliminate or, or mitigate the ecological wounds so that natural, natural processes can completely rebound? Well, the, I, I think the rewilding movement can succeed if we are able to do and to promote rewilding at a scale, mm -hmm. joining forces with the protection movement. So this is what protect the best and restore the rest. This is a, this what the slogan says. 30%, mm -hmm. for example, by 2030. And this, uh, this is important initiative with that goal. And many governments have already committed to that. And then in the longer, in the longer term, as uh, Dr. E.O. Wilson is saying, defense, at least half of the planet for nature, because uh, we need to keep enough land and sea for nature, uh, because this is the only way to mitigate our impact. Uh, and more important, to save ourselves. Let's be clear. Okay, let's talk about an example. This was a little bit now uh, the theoretical. And, um, I'm wondering, like, as you said, we want to go for a natural uh, solution. So, taking an example, can you explain um, how rewilding can solve, can help solving um, environmental, um, social, and uh, economic problems? Yeah, I have a fantastic example. Let's take an example of what of uh, or what we are doing and what we call trophic uh, change restoration in the Rodopi Mountains in Bulgaria. We work with the hunting community to restore uh, red deer and fallow deer populations in the area. If we have more deer, uh, there will be more food for the wolf, which also lives in the area. With more deer, wolves do not, they, they don't need to kill livestock. Therefore, the, the human-wolf conflict is decreased. And this is a conflict that usually brings poaching and poisoning, uh, and of course kills many other species. A higher density of deer means more dead deer on the field, for example, killed by wolves, so the scavengers, the, the vultures living in the area, they are also benefiting. A good population of vultures, you know, that is the cleaning squad of the ecosystems, bring important ecosystem services. And then finally, if we have more deer, we have wolf and we have vultures on a beautiful landscape, this is going to be a tourist attraction. Uh, in Rewild in Europe, we usually say, there's a very nice, there are very nice theaters, but where are the actors? And now we will have the actors. So therefore, um, we have the creation of wildlife watching and other nature-based business. So, so you see, no, with this example, this is the reintroduction of a key species, but is bringing numerous positive cascading effects, both ecological and socioeconomic. Yeah, uh, the, 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 it's, 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 as you say, cascading. And uh, we, yes. have, we have to watch it in that way. And, um, uh, in your opinion, what is what is needed to to trigger a, a mass societal uh, societal um, um, embrace of rewilding? Well, I think that uh, positive narrative is not enough. What we should is unite with many other and demonstrate the positive uh, results of rewilding. So not only narrative but also uh, demonstration. Mm -hmm. And we are all using the same few examples over and over as if rewilding was the exception. No, we all talk about Yellowstone and we have three or four examples that we are always using. And what we have to do is to use many other examples, as small, as small and big, that, it, that mm -hmm. already exist. And, and for exactly the same you were referring before to the European Rewilding Network. And this is a platform that we created to share experience and there are already almost uh, 70 members in 27 different countries. Yeah, that's yeah, that's only 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 in Europe, and uh, also the documentary, yeah. the, the document the documentary uh, series Europe's Europe's New Wild um, triggered um, a lot of uh, awareness about rewilding uh, all all yes. over Europe. and all, all over the world, but all Europe because yeah, it was on the net Geo Wild. Um, yeah. So. When we're talking about, uh, about this um, social acceptance and um, in your work, did you observe a shift, which I think is really necessary in thinking and in, in, in the beliefs of people from being separate from nature to, to being a part of it? Yes, I, I can see the shift, but um, I think my vision can be skewed, but because obviously I work in the natural conservation world. Yeah, yeah. My, my worst fear, my worst fear is that millions of people, especially in the cities and especially in young people, live completely disconnected from nature. And we cannot allow this to happen because otherwise, who will work, who will fight, who will vote for nature to be preserved and restored? So yes. provide engagement with nature from summer camps to kids, 
to bring nature inside the cities is key for, for feeling part of nature and not something separate from our lives. Yeah, and the rewilding group is actually also working a, a lot with the, with the younger generation. Yeah. Each of the projects, uh, it's I know. Very important. Yeah. 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 We're we're involved with children and with schools and. Um, uh, so uh, you did lead a lot of projects uh, during the, during your career in the various rewilding areas, and um, if you could choose one, where re rewilding really managed to to both shape the landscape and uh, gain the acceptance of the local local community. Uh, which would you choose and why? Well, we are still a long way to go, but my choice would be the Danube Delta rewilding area, where wetland restoration brings together rewilded fishermen, uh, scientists and local mayors. Uh, we, for example, dams have been removed and providing benefits for many species and also for the stakeholders. Um, and, and I love the narrative of the breathing of the lakes, but I leave this explanation for our next speaker. And in fact, I, I should reveal now that, uh, well, you saw the picture behind, which is not true, but I should reveal that now I'm presently in Daniel Delta. And I had the privilege to be traveling and working in the region the last week with uh, him, with the next speaker and with his team. And of course, it has been fantastic. And uh, tell us, how long are you staying in the Daniel Delta? I'm still staying a few more weeks until the end yes. of the month. So I'm, yeah, I'm super happy to be here. Yeah, sure. Especially as a, as, a, as a bird watcher. <laughs> of course, a bird watcher in Daniel Delta in the month of June. This is a, is a dream. And how can you focus on other work? <laughs> Very difficult. I'm not going to show that I have the binoculars just here in, uh, <laughs> on the table. Well, I expected that. <laughs> okay, before, before handing over to, to Mikhailo, uh, let's, let's take a little, little trip to, to where Delhi is. Uh, I'm going to, to, to share my screen now and uh, Let's go to Daniel Delta. I hope that, uh, that you enjoyed this virtual trip and uh, now going over directly to Daniel Delta. Misha, please. Well, thank you and good day from a uh, very warm welcome from a uh, very cold and rainy Delta. <laughs> Let me just share uh, my screen with you. Yeah, just a moment. I hope you can see it's coming yeah well oh let me tell you a very short story of otherwise very rich narrative of nature conservation and restoration of nature in the danube delta well the danube delta was just mentioned one of the largest wetlands and natural uh, still very much natural wetland in europe 
three quarters of it lies in Romania, one quarter in Ukraine, and a tiny, tiny bit in the Republic of Moldova. If you look at the Delta in a kind of larger landscape, not in the very strict geographical terms. And the habitats and the diversity of the landscape in the Delta is stunning. It's, it's a big river that flows in the very dry uh, grassland landscapes and the whole diversity of habitats it creates. It, it's just dazzling from coastal sand dunes to of course marshes, riverine forests, uh, and of course steps that especially in uh, last centuries would start right off the edge of the marshes. It supports well, amazing biodiversity but also it's inhabited by the people and there's roughly more than one million people living inside what we call the Danube Delta landscape. And like elsewhere in the, the middle of 20th century after the Second World War, a big development came in the Danube Delta. Uh, a, lot of agri a lot of lands from the floodplain were taken for agriculture and production of crops and foods. Uh, the dikes were erected, the borders were built uh, on the floodplain. The forestries came with the artificial forestry plantations and uh, fisheries came and we built a lot of fish fishing ponds and uh, fish breeding ponds because we destroyed many of the spawning sites with agriculture. And then ultimately the biggest changes uh, and the challenges of last year is the big navigation and shipping industries in the Danube Delta. So to give you kind of a taste of how much transformation happened, this is, this is how the Delta looked like before the major transformation. All this pink represents more or less kind of natural uh, state of the landscape in the Delta before the dikes. And this is what, where we are at the moment. You see the major large parts of the Delta were taken, especially along the north, the northern side of the Delta. A big boulders created. Most of the large lakes and wetlands were converted to water reservoirs and are managed by for irrigation, sometimes drinking water supplies and fisheries. And all these green jewels in, uh, well, scattered around these landscapes, these are the recent major wetland restoration uh, uh, projects that were implemented on both sides of the, del of the Delta. The first the first one of the first people who started uh, wetland restoration in the Delta were so the Romanian Danube Delta National Institute. Uh, looking at these large agricultural boulders in the middle of the Danube Delta, these are very dry and, and, and drained uh, systems in otherwise very rich and, and waterlogged landscape was very unusual. And it seems like those years, the approach to restoration would be very straightforward. What you need is to reflood them let the water in again. And this, this is what has been done in Romania in, in, in 1994, 1996. The gaps in the dikes were made in this agricultural boulders. And first, the response of the nature was very, very rich. A lot of birds came and, and, and the, the areas were used again for feed, by fish for spawning. Then what, what we realized just in the, in the next few years, m most of these gaps in the dam in the dams got silted and sedimented. So then there was a lot, very long kind of process of learning. What is what we call the genius of the place? What are the key driving natural processes? How the Delta functions? And then, then that took quite some time for the ecologists and stakeholders and conservationists in the Danube Delta to understand. One of the key features of the Delta is actually it's a growing landscape. It's still growing Delta. It carries a lot of sediment and grows into the Black Sea, creating new habitats, new lands. And this is, this is quite unique because dreaming of conservation, you can't actually well say that our ultimate goal would be like in the mountains, a beech forest or a spruce forest. In fact, we're living in a very dynamic landscape where we don't know what would be the ultimate state if we want to bring the nature back. So we, um, these are the key fundamental processes. And then uh, one of the interesting stories and, and, and revelations of the last years is actually, if you come to the Danube Delta, unlike the Western Europe, you will not see a single red deer in the Delta, nor the large herbivore. Most of these animals were hunted in the 20th centuries and uh, they were replaced and then if 20th century, apart from agriculture, big cattle farming came and the thousands of cattle were grazing this landscape, supporting very mosaic meadows. 
they were rich, they were important for many of the bird species, fishes and amphibia. And with the decline of, of uh, agriculture in the end of 20th century, with the collapse of the Soviet Union and the, US and the Soviet systems, these herbivores vanished. And for the first time in history, we ended up with the and the Danube Delta where we don't have the wild uh, herbivores that are extinct, nor domestic herbivores that were replacing them. And what we learn, in fact, with the disappearance of these uh, animals, the whole transformation of, of habitats and the vegetation has happened, which is not natural. They are, the large areas were just are completely covered by reed beds and the biodiversity decline. And then ultimately, well, and of course, the, the fundamental role is actually flooding and what Danny, Danny, Danny was calling the breath of the lakes, the breath of the floodplain. It's a very dry landscape, and the precipitation is much higher than than uh, much lo lower. Let's, sorry, than the evaporation. So there's a lot more water evaporates than comes from the falls from the sky. And in these circumstances, the salts in the organic matter they accumulate in the floodplain. They creating most of the lakes that were isolated from the Danube. They're already brackish, in fact, in some of the cases, as well as the floodplain. Um, so what was what we learned from uh, rewilding and from nature restoration although we don't know what should be the ultimate goal we have to remove the large sections of the dams to restore not only flooding but also the sediment processes and the vegetation development so in the next projects the large sections of dikes were being removed on the danube delta islands it's one of the examples it's a very big island of nearly 2000 hectare a bit more on the Ukrainian side of the Danube Delta. You see it's a very dry salt marsh. This reddish color represents the salt marshes in the, in the middle of the Danube Delta. And the vision was that if we reflood, remove large sections of the dikes, that should look like that. That was drawn by an artist in 2001. And by removal of dikes, this is what has happened a few days later. You see how quickly the nature responds and this is, this is what happens. I mean, it, this is, the response is quite amazing and, and, and it's incredible. But further on, again, coming back to important lessons. So once you have this water in sediments on the island, the, the vegetation starts developing. The forests, the bushes, they, they, they develop. They tend to overgrow in this very rich soil and, and uh, southern climate. So we realize that the large herbivores, the, they are the architects on the landscape. They, they open up many of the um, places in the Delta and they're fundamental keystone species for, for many of the insects that, that, that whose life cycle is actually linked to the large herbivores. They, and they're important for not only birds, but ultimately the larger birds of prey and mammals, the whole life cycle is linked to these animals. So as the next steps, we're bringing the large herbivores back in the Delta and you, see very well it was also pitched on the video how the water buffalo that was brought on Yermakov Island is doing his job of <laughs> creating this habitat maintaining this whole system mosaic and pushing back a little bit the reed bed development um, in, in the past there were wild horses of course widely present in Europe they're extinct and we're using corning horses now to complement the composition of herbivores and, and this is again happening on Yermakov Island in the Danube Delta. And apart from, of course, domestic species that substitute the extinct species, we brought also red deer and the fallow deer. And we're monitoring how they actually affect the Delta and what happens uh, and how they influence the vegetation on this large scale. Um, Apart from uh, wetlands, of course, the, Dan the Danube Delta was important uh, for, for steps. Very little steps have left, but under natural circumstances, the steps would start right off the wetlands. And there was a lot of biodiversity, especially the large animals who, who migrated and used these different types of habitats for, uh, for their life cycle and for, for, for living and as part of effort to restore the steps, not only by physical restoration of formerly plowed areas, we try to bring back the animals that inhabited this landscape. And this, these are the coolants that are in Prilly's area and one of the large step areas in the Danube Delta. So, I mean, kind of a summary of 
supports the the transformation of thinking um, and um, nature restoration you can summarize it quickly from first attempts to reflood the the big islands and making gaps in the dams to large scale rewilding and bring back um, the natural processes at large scale I and mean, removing large sections of the dikes allowing the sedimentation to come and then uh, bringing back the large animals to influence the vegetation that starts developing these areas. This is kind of where we are stand as rewilding and of course all these actions are built on the foundation of the new economies and, and in fact some of these areas that I've shown there are concessions and where we work together with the local concessioners and businesses to support what this uh, this very interesting and, and ex in fact exciting rewarding stories. So this is uh, very very short of the story of what we're doing in the Danube Delta. And um, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Mikhailo, for for the presentation and co congratulations of all, on all the fantastic uh, work in progress uh, your team has. Uh, managed to to do in the Danube Delta. Um, we only have uh, five minutes, but let's take seven minutes for the for the Q and A as we experience some technical details. So um, uh, uh, there's one question for Delhi. So Delhi mentioned the attempts from from Udo. Delhi mentioned the attempts to increase the deer population. Isn't more deer a potential problem of the regrowth of forest trees? Do you accompany this with a study? Well. It depends on the it depends on the environments, but in general, what we think is that if you think on the nature before the humans were affecting, the, let's say the nature, there were deer, there were wolves, there were forests. There was never a case uh, where deer were exterminating the forest. What is important is, as we always say, is to have all the pieces in the ecosystems. So uh, sometimes in some forests where there are no predators, there's lots of deer. Sometimes fence it not by fencing, but maybe by a highway or there are some problems so they cannot go to other areas, they cannot migrate and they grow in big populations, of course they can have an effect on the forest. But also in many other habitats, the thanks to the herbivores, we keep open more open landscapes that have uh, uh, less, uh, let's say, less risk of fire. So I think all this is relative, but we cannot say that deer is damaging the forest because deer and forest, they have been uh, cohabitating for millions of years. Thanks, Delhi. Then we have a question from Namibia, from, uh, from Marie. Uh, what is motivating the choice of the species reintroduced in, uh, in an area? Is it because uh, it was there before and vanished? Is it more because of local opportunity and partnership? It's a mixer. So this is a typical question, put it in the other way. Many people ask us, okay, so what are the species that you are reintroducing? The ones that disappeared 100 years ago, 500 years ago, 5,000 years ago. And we always say, uh, we look to the past to establish what were the baselines and to get information, but we are in fact looking to the future. So when we choose the species, we choose the species because they were native in most of the cases, in almost all the cases, because they were there and also because they have a, a very important ecological function. So they are keystone species that we need to bring back to the ecosystems. And this is, this is the, the, those are the main reasons to choose the, the species. But we are not trying to uh, let's say revert, or we are not trying to set up uh, the, the ecosystem that it was uh, 1,000 years ago in one area, because we now we know that uh, everything that happened 1,000 years ago is no longer there. Society has changed, the habitats have changed, the number of populations have, have, have changed, and most important, climate is changing and is changing the ecosystems. Now a question to, to Michael, or maybe Michael, you can give an example uh, from Christopher. Uh, Christoph, uh, could you mention the kind of monitoring you do in uh, rewilding areas in parallel with uh, reintroduction? For example, uh, plants, night, native exotic insects, etc. Well, this, yes, uh, the monitoring we do for very much now focusing on diff different places uh, on vegetation. We want to understand how the herbivores actually affects the development of vegetation after removal of the dikes. And we're using different techniques. It's a very difficult to access area where often we use remote sensing, sentinel and playing with the different indexes. In the step areas where we have direct access to the lands, we use more direct observations and, and, and understand how the species 
in in the step conditions change how the native grasses advance to the formerly destroyed uh, systems. Um, we're coming up with a more and more sophisticated monitoring. Now there's a new uh, idea of using acoustic monitoring to understand a bit more different smaller animals, sometimes elusive nocturnal animals, how they come back to the system. Thanks, Michelle. Well, that's uh, quite extensive monitoring you're doing. Yeah. Uh, Delhi, this is an irrelevant question uh, from Claudia uh, Schwarzer. Who is owning the rewilded landscape? Is it private or public property? All kinds. There are kinds of situations. So, for example, in we are trying to hold rights for rewilding. So, in the well, first of all, in Western Europe, most of the land is private. In Eastern Europe, in generally, uh, most of the land is public, and you work differently. What we are not doing as a, as an entity is mainly to try to buy land because it's very expensive and, and we are trying to do rewilding in, in big uh, pieces of land uh, in, in, in whole areas or regions. So what we try to do is to secure rights to the rewilding. So for example, grazing rights, hunting rights, we secure hunting rights to not to hunt. Uh, we secure grazing rights to be able to, to release those large herbivores that will make difference in the landscape. So for each area is different, but uh, we are trying to work in all the areas, in areas that are estate areas, in areas that are, that are communal, coming from municipalities or communal land, and also in private land, because in some places there's mostly 90% is private land. And another question coming from uh, Vanya, are indigenous land management practices taken into consideration when starting the projects? Like yeah, of course, very much so. But uh, very much so. But uh, but in Europe, the place where you the place where you mostly need to take this into account is the, in Lapland. From our eight uh, rewilding areas uh, in Swedish Lapland is the way with where this is more important to, 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 to take into account. But then, of course, when we work with the local communities, uh, with the municipalities, for example, this is key because it's impossible to do rewilding if you don't have the agreement of the local communities. I don't know if, Michelle, you want to add, but I, for example, in Daniel Delta, this is, this is very clear. Then a question very much so, and very often rewilding adds something new to the otherwise traditional, very intensive agriculture. So very often they use this, the big wilderness areas, they have very little use, and we build something, new economies on the basis of the nature that they have within the community and the public lands. Misha, another question from you, from Luca. Could you perhaps explain again briefly what causes the salinization in the Danube Delta area and how this is connected to the lack of grazing? Uh, well, uh, there's more uh, evaporation than precipitation. This, it's a very dry landscape. And in the natural scene, the water of the Danube floods, the floodplain washes away the salt and takes them away. If that's inst interrupted by the dikes, the salt is accumulated in the soil. And over the few years, the soil gets very salty. It turns into salt marsh. The same happens to the lakes. All the catchments, all the small rivers carry a lot of salt. That's kind of a local geographical feature. And the lakes accumulates that. Without the connection to the Danube and the proper connection, the breath process, the salt accumulates in the lakes. All the kind of the coastal areas along the Black Sea on the north, they are rather salty wetlands if they are disconnected from, let's say, freshwater sources. So the smaller lakes and lagoons, they're all salty. That's a geographical feature. Thanks, Misha. And uh, Delhi, uh, I have an impression there's a lot of young people with us today, and um, many of them are probably urban dwellers because of, uh, we have received several questions about this. Um, there's one coming from, uh, from Alex. Delhi, you spoke about connecting people in cities with nature. How can we bring the principles of rewilding into urban areas? Yeah, that's a very good question. I don't think I'm able to, to, to answer the question specifically, but I really think that this is something we should do. Of course, more than the principles, what we have to do is to bring nature into the cities. And there are a lot of experience and a lot of initiatives, but we need much more. We need cities that are more close to ecosystems that uh, are now, that are, are simple cities of cement and we want the nature inside the cities. And then also, uh, I'm not going to answer the question because I don't really know, but I, what I can explain is the, the rewilding scale. So in rewilding Europe, we don't look for wilderness. So, so these spaces that are completely natural because in Europe, they doesn't, doesn't exist. 
So what we try to do is we work with what we call the rewilding scale. And we try to push this scale of rewilding, imagine from zero to 10, there are some areas, very nice areas in Danube Delta. Maybe we can uh, take Danube Delta from six to nine or from six to eight, but in the cities, if we manage to go from one to three or from one to four, it's going to be a lot. And it's going to be a big change for nature and for the people that are living in urban areas. And also, I don't want to, I don't want to forget about what I said before. My, one of my nightmares is to think that there are millions of people in the cities that are completely disconnected by nature, because if they're disconnected, they don't care. And if they don't care, we have a problem. Yeah, yeah that's true. Thanks, Delian. Let's take uh, uh, one more question. Maybe, Misha, uh, this could be for you from Robert. Um, what limits how quickly you can restore the landscape? Is it more your resources or natural processes? Well, I think a little bit both. Uh, well, I should say, yeah, uh, bureaucracies, <laughs> of course, exist everywhere, but the, well, it's quite difficult to say whether or not you have restored. There's a lot of elements. The more we do, the more we realize that the elements, some of the elements are missing. Like, well, first making the gaps in the dams, now we bring back uh, the large herbivores and then are the predators, for instance, in the landscape. That's, that's the next phase. We can move from, as Daly says, from zero to uh, different scales of rewilding. It's, it, it's a story and it's, it, it's a journey. I don't, think, well, I don't think we can call our job completed anywhere over the last, let's say a few years. Realistically, it takes these five to 10 years normally for area to do significant change, let's say. And, but it's very, especially in the Delta, it's dynamic landscape. There's no ultimate state, as I said. There's no ultimate goal for, for what we want to achieve. There's one more question that I would like to pose to, to Delhi, and then we're done, uh, because it connects yeah. this one. Um, do you, from, from Tama, Tamas Erde, do you find it challenging to establish new rewilding areas and especially interconnected habitats across Europe? And how can you address this problem? Yeah, that's, that's one of the biggest challenges. So connectivity in Europe is one of the biggest challenges. We, as, as, as you know, we have a Natura 2000 network. So 80% of uh, Europe is protected under Natura 2000. And this is the biggest network of uh, protected areas in the world. But we have big problems for connections because as I said before, Europe is crowded. They're full of uh, highways and roads and cities. So the main challenge um, is to develop in the European Commission, they call it this uh, green infrastructure, no? like uh, this uh, green uh, network that will connect the different, uh, the different protected areas. And for us, this is rewilding. In fact, in Central Apennines, uh, our main task, our main rewilding task is working on, the, on what we call coexistence corridors. And those are corridors between the big national parks in the Apennines to be sure that the bears, the wolves, and many other animals can go from one, uh, for one national park to the other. Well, uh, Delhi, thank you for this answer, and uh, thank you both for, for being here uh, with us today and uh, for doing the presentation and our talk. Uh, uh, yeah, we have a really engaged audience. There's so many great questions uh, in the Q&A section. I'm really sorry we can't go, we can't go over them uh, due to lack of time. Uh, however, in the chat box, uh, my colleague Meleke uh, has posted our email address, info.com, where you can uh, send us your questions and uh, we'll do our best uh, to, to answer. You can also follow us um, in, uh, through our social media challenge, uh, channels. Uh, the links to our social media are also now um, in the chat box. Uh, later this uh, afternoon, there's going to, to, to be an event um, uh, from the Global Rewilding Alliance somewhere, somewhere in, in, in the afternoon. So if you want to, to learn more about rewilding and uh, climate change, uh, uh, feel free to, to register for this upcoming event. I think it's around three in the, three in the afternoon, but um, I'm not sure it is in the schedule of the UN Decade pro uh, Program. Uh, and again, thank you everybody, everyone for uh, your participation and uh, for your interest and for learning about uh, rewilding in Europe. Uh, I wish you all um, a nice uh, rest of the day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.